on a supermax prison to year 2162. <laughs> well, so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what happened with that. That didn't have to happen. That did not have to happen. Okay. Because, so what ended up happening is, so when Sal and Willie, so anyway, you know how the his attorney says, oh, yeah, they use Valdez, and, and look how Valdez got, got a short sentence for telling all his best friend, you know, on this cocaine cowboy, for the first time, yeah. all the truth is going to come out. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I, I sat there in court and said, first of all, it's bullshit, because I had my 10 years before I even knew you guys were arrested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second of all, when the government came to me to subpoena me, I had no choice. If the government subpoenas you, you got to go. Yeah. But number three, what you don't say there is that you use my testimony to make your clients innocent. Because your, your defense was when George Valdez walked away, they walked away. Yeah. And the evidence is that if they had not walked away when George got out of prison, he would have been back with them. Exactly. Uh, right? So, so in reality. But what ends up happening, so they were trying to make a deal with the government before the trial. See, yeah. A lot of people don't know that. They were trying to make a deal with the government, but they got greedy. Yeah. And, and they wanted to keep more money, and they wanted to get less years. And, uh, and I told Sal, and, and sitting, so, so he goes to trial. Of course, neatly, I never imagined, and, and, and I told this to the agents, when, when it came out that they had killed so many witnesses. Yeah, it's like a I long hit list. Four up and down every Bible that they never would have done that. Yeah. That's, it was so shocking to me. It's like me finding out that my, my brother, who I love the most on this earth, yeah. is, is going out murdering witnesses. Yeah. It wasn't like that, man. We were not violent. We were just young kids, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's Every kind of like the big difference be between, uh, b because you re read about Salma Gut and Willy Falcone and also Gustavo Falcone that was, came up now a year ago. He was, he was hiding for 15 years. But if you see that hit list uh, with witnesses and, and it was terrible to read. So, so, oh yeah, and uh, then, and, 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 the, and the witnesses were people that they grew up with. That's what's wow. sad. Wow, oh, I didn't know Most that. Wow. But another thing that, that happened was they bribed the jurors. Exactly. When, uh, and, when, they and, away, when they walked away, when they got acquitted, right? Yeah. And he, and he walked out of the jail, first place he went to, his parents and my parents lived 10, 10 blocks away from each other. Yeah. He came over to my parents' house. Yeah. And we sat down. I, my parents always kept the bedroom for me. Yeah. And we sat down. So you, you're gonna be the, you'll be the first one to hear this besides what's going to come out in Cocaine Cowboy. Yeah. We sat down in his bed, in my bed, and I said, Sal, work out a deal with the government, man. You offer them 5,000 kilos and, and 50 so much million dollars. Yeah. Do you think that they're just going to walk away? Yeah. They're going to be and, so pissed. I'm going to tell between the legs? Yeah. <laughs> he was like, I said, I said, all you want. And no, he said, this was his word, verbatim. I fucked him once, I'm going to fuck him again. Oh. And I said, I no. said, Sal, let me tell you something. All you've done is win a little battle. You will yeah. never win the war against these people. No, no. I, I, exactly. I mean, one thing, you can never win against the government. I mean, you, you have to go to exile or something. That, that's what... I mean, that's the thing you realized, and that, that kind of saved your life. That, I mean, you, you, you were tired of fighting. You just gave up and, and yeah. sent all your assets and, and back. And my consequences. Yeah, and exactly. You know, and it was tough for me because, look, I have been living the life of a millionaire for a lot of years. Yeah. To be guilty, to go to jail, not knowing if I would get a life sentence or not. Yeah. Not have a dollar for a candy bar. I got, I got a phone call that my father had been diagnosed with cancer and had six months to live. Yeah. And then my ex-wife took off with my daughter for three years. I didn't find them. Wow. I, and I'm in prison. So yeah. my world went from worse to like horrifically worse. Yeah, when kids are involved. Uh, and and oh. um, uh, in fact, I had a, a little uh, planning to my interview here, here but, but we, we kind of talked through many of these points. But I'm trying to, uh, like, my, my, my that plan was to talk um, about uh, the cartel, how it started. And secondly, the cars, which we kind of talked about. Third, the girls. <laughs> Fourth, the money. Fifth, the prison. Sixth, life after prison. And then finally, God. Sure. Yeah. But so, uh, I, I would kind of come to place in this into different parts, but it's already been super, super interesting. So, so it's, it, it, it's right, no lack of... How the cartel started. And I'll tell you one thing that is, 
there was never a Medellin drug cartel. Uh -huh. So that's the first thing people need to know. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and when I came out this year and started talking about it, people thought, ah, he's crazy, he don't know what he's talking about. Until recently, one of the Oshoas, which yeah. is one of the few survivors, exactly. said verbatim what I said. Uh -huh. I said there was no Medellin cartel. The first organized group. That's why when I tell people I was U.S. head of all operation for a group that became known as the Medellin Drug Cartel yeah. was because when I started in 76, I was 20 years old with Manuel Garcia. Manuel Garcia and his three partners controlled 95% of all the cocaine that came into America. They were the biggest. Yeah. This is when cocaine was not even in the DEA radar. Uh, and it, it was it was Ochoa brothers and Garcia and uh, it was oh, no, the, the, uh, it was it was Manuel Garces, a guy that's alive, so I won't mention his name. A guy that's dead, Jorge Donia, and a guy that's dead, Julio Armando. Uh -huh. So and me, us five, we, I I ran everything in the United States. They ran everything in Colombia. When I went to prison in '80, Pablo comes along. In the meantime, '79 or something, all Pablo was doing was uh, going to uh, Peru and and buying paste, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. bringing it to Colombia. For the for those head guys, uh -huh. so it ended up. Then it ended up that between eighty and eighty one, eighty two, five factions grew out. So the Ochoa brothers became one, uh, one of the members. Pablo, then you got Gacha, yeah. And the really the biggest one, no one even knows about. Pablo Escobar was not by no means, by uh -huh. no means was he the biggest or the richest. Exactly at, at, at that time. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to tell you something. No, even, even later on. Really? Even until the day he died. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all the money the government said, the United States and Forbes said he made, it's all bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, he made, we all made a lot of money, but what people don't realize, the cost, yeah. the way that we were spending money. Yeah. You know, I, I was handling $85 million a month in 1977. Wow. You know? And, and I was making a million, two, three million dollars a month, but I was spending... A million to three million dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And 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 I read one one of your uh, ways to import this was every month. Uh, you you, you uh, it was in big engines. Was it in ship engines? Uh, As a matter of fact, I, I just interviewed that that undercover agent who now we're friends because we're both Christian. Oh And yeah. I said, I said, do you want me to tell you how we used to bring it in at the beginning when you guys didn't even know we existed? Yeah. And he's like. He said, he said to me, he says, you know, one day I'm giving this dossier and then pops your name. I don't even know who the hell you are. And then I started, I said, how the hell we don't even know who this guy is as <laughs> big, rich and powerful as he is. I said, we're bringing it in. <laughs> what we would do is we would send Caterpillar engines. Ah, to Caterpillar engines. Yeah. To get rebuilt, right? And that was common because it was cheaper to rebuild over there than in the U.S. Ah, but okay. Instead of bringing the whole engine back, they would hollow out the engine. Yep. And inside every engine, a 55 gallon drum would fit inside and it would hold up to 100, 120 kilos. Wow. Uh, so, and, and, and exactly, it was reloaded, welded, and sealed with oil and grease to distract exactly. the DA. Exactly. Well, then seal, then you put heavy grease and Crazy. you can put all the dogs in the world that you want. They're yeah. going to smell now. And, 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 and then you seal the engine back. And they never found out ever? And, no. And I said this to the agent. And I said, you know who used to get out of the airport for us? He's like, who? I said, two custom agents. He's like, oh, man, you got to be crazy. I said, yeah. I, we had two custom agents. And uh, I started paying him in 77, $3,000 per kilo. Yeah. In 79, when I finished paying him, I was paying him 7000 And that was like every month I'd be paying him four or $5 million. This guy lived in a little house worth, <laughs> you know, 50,000 euros. I, I mean, I mean, where is that customs guy today? Because I see here from your book, towards the beginning of March 1979, I was paying them seven and a half million US dollars. It's like, what? Oh, yeah. It was crazy. I, I mean, talk about getting away. Those guys don't have to work. You know why they got away? Because while they were doing all this, they lived in the same house. Yeah. They uh, drove an old beat up Chevrolet. Yeah. And wow. They lived in the house by the river that was like a dump. Uh, I don't uh, know where they put their money or if it was buried underneath the uh, ground, but they're uh, the only people I ever know that never, ever got busted. It, it, you, you should try to find those guys and say congratulations or something. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I never even knew their name. 
Oh, you wow. Know? Ah, of course. It, it was the, every third Thursday of the month in Barranquilla, they would load up the cargo. It would come to Miami the third Thursday of the month. And I get a phone call at five o'clock in the morning and they would say, uh, whatever code was for that month. Yeah. At a certain place. So basically they would say, hey, there's a U-Haul at such and such parking lot. Yeah. And there's, and there's a set of keys underneath this and we have another key. So I used to go there, get the U-Haul, take it to our warehouse, empty it out, and then bring it back to the parking lot and leave it there. Wow. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So it was, I mean, like clockwork. Yeah. Like, man, many engines coming into the U.S., Caterpillar engines <laughs> and yeah. out. Wow. Like, you know, this was six, seven engines. Yeah. So it was not a, a big, big deal. But uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's how it, it really, uh, the, the, what became known, now recently became known the Medellin Cartel was because the United States realized that if we can group all these people under one name, yeah. and what was happening at that time that was very, very popular was the oil cartels. It was when they had the oil crisis, 1978. Oh, exactly, and Saudis was, and everything. Yeah. Right, there, there was no gas in Miami that you, you have to do this long line. Yeah. So they ended up saying, hey, they're powerful, they're from Medellin, I mean, we make more money than General Motors used to make in a month. Yeah. And, you know, and we'll just call the Medellin Drug Cartel. Because otherwise, we'd have to call Pablo Escobar. We had to call Jorge Ochoa. We had to call Gacha. You know, it's complicated. So anybody that dealt drugs in, in uh, Medellin, yeah. they were all part of the cartel. Uh, and and, um, uh, and then, then you got some from Bolivia. Was that after your first prison sentence or, 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 or was that a part of this Medellin? So in, in uh, 78, uh, a friend, well, Sal says, hey, there's this captain of the Bolivian Air Force that wants to talk to you. Yeah. And uh, we're paying 18,000 a kilo in Colombia, 19,000 a kilo. Colombia wasn't even producing cocaine or nothing. Colombia was just crystallizing it. That's all they were doing back then. Okay. So, and he's like, he'd like to talk to you. So we set up a meeting in Miami. He's like, look, uh, he worked for Roberto Suarez, right? The most powerful drug lord in the world at that time, really in reality. Exactly. So he's like, he's like, look, for every kilo you buy, we'll give you one on credit and we'll sell them to you at 10,000. So we're like, man, if we bring in one load a month, and if we buy 300 and get 300 on credit, that's 600. And we only got 10,000 in it versus 18. We need, I mean, a quarter of the capital we're using. We can actually do two loads a month. Yeah. So, and, and make, I mean, we're selling it for 70,000 in, uh, in California, paying 10 and five transportation, 15. We're making $55,000 a kilo. Yeah. You bring it, do the math. You bring in 1,000 kilos, you know, you've got $55 million. And, and Roberto Suarez, that's kind of like the uh, Alejandro Sosa in, in Scarface, kind of the same guy. Uh, it, it is the same guy. Yeah. It is uh, the same guy. And did you, did you ever meet him personally? Yeah, I met him. And, you know, and the guy had overthrown four or five governments, you know? Yeah. But uh, so I went down there and, uh, and we struck out the deal. And the reason I ended up in, in Bolivia was because when we were ready, to, the airplane was ready to go to uh, Bolivia to pick it up. I was in Colombia showing them the airstrip. They're like, my, who's Tao, who, who's the guy that was in Bolivia waiting for it, for, uh, for our airplane. And he's like, uh, hey, all they got here is what you paid for. They don't have any of the credit. So I went down there to straighten things out. Yeah. Anyway, long, long story. And uh, I had to go and meet with Somoza because I, I was arranging to do a big marijuana load uh, that we were going to transport to Nicaragua, to Corn Island, to an island in Nicaragua. Yeah. And then Somoza was going to send it to the United States in, in uh, diplomatic refrigerated cargoes, ah. a ship. So anyway, long story, I was supposed to get there. There was no flight like normally there is now. Back then in South America, there might be one flight, yeah. you know, from one country to another. So I got on the airplane and Manny Garcia, when he jumped on the airplane, he had a heart attack. He's like, are you crazy? Yeah. You know, don't you realize? And, and he was against the whole deal from the beginning. Yeah. He didn't want us to do it. He felt like, hey, you're making more money than, than nothing. You, your risk factor is zero. Yeah. Why do this? Why? Why? You don't need no more. But to yeah. me, I don't, think it was more, I don't think it was as much that I wanted more money. It was just the thrill of something else because yeah. the money was nothing. I mean, I, I had my maid one day. 
I was sitting on my couch in my office, and she's like, can you help me move it so I can clean behind it? Because I haven't cleaned in about a month, and I did. And there was a, a grocery bag with $700,000 that I didn't even know who dropped it there or how long it been there, you know? <laughs> That's crazy. And, and, and uh, so, uh, Roberto Suarez, uh, you met him personally when you, when you, uh, when you flew? Um, I, I, I met him when I first went to Bolivia to make the deal, but we didn't do any, uh, we didn't have any conversation about drug dealing. All of our dealings were with this captain of the Bolivian Air Force. Who was oh, yeah, guy, exactly. You know, and General Coca, who was really the guy handling everything for, uh, you know, for Suarez. Uh, I, I like, uh, I mean, how... Ha- so, sorry? He was a gentleman. He was, uh, you know, yeah. very, uh, very, very powerful. And uh, very few people even know about him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, he, he, uh, he died year 2000, I see. And he says one thing he regrets now, uh, he said before he died, that was his trade with cocaine. Uh, I mean, that, that uh, he, he, he regret that uh, today. Uh, or not today, but before he died. Uh, right, right, right. But... Um, uh, and uh, uh, oh yeah, which <coughs> Scarface or Miami Vice? Which do you prefer? Which is most realistic? Oh, 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 oh. I got pissed off at Scarface. Uh, I, number one, because they portrayed Cubans the way we were not. You know, ah, yeah, and uh, it gave a bad image. You know yeah. about Tony Montana and all of that. I mean, I like I like the movies, entertaining. Yeah. Uh, some people said that a lot of it comes from my life because Tony Montana had a line. I had a cougar, you know, ah. a club that he went to was a club that I frequented. There's a great book you got to read. It's called Hotel Scarface, The Mutiny. Exactly. I should read that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a good friend of mine wrote that. It's very well researched and uh, really, really well done. Very realistic in, in the book, uh, as opposed to the first two episodes, Cocaine Cowboys, they're not very realistic, but the guys that did it, the guy that did it, they're like, he said, when people ask me, like, how real is that? And I answer, what do you think? So, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 because. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to give you an idea. I don't even know who that guy Roberts is. I never exactly. met that guy. I, 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 I would have known any big player in Miami. I yeah. would have no doubt about it, you know. Now, had he been involved in the marijuana trade, I wouldn't have known about him. Because I didn't know any of the marijuana people. Because we were not involved in that. It was Exactly. It was, reason that Manuel Garcia shifted to cocaine was because with three people, we can do 600 kilos, which will make us much more than bringing in 40,000 pounds where you need 20 people. Exactly. Uh, you know? Uh, uh, so, it, it, much more money per, per, uh, per volume, um, I, I assume. And, um, uh, and also, yeah, when you ended up in prison first time uh, in the U.S., uh, it, it was kind, kind of uh, you, you said in your book, you, you're like, um, uh, let me see. Uh, sometimes I woke up in a good mood and bought ice cream for the entire cell block. It's like I could afford every luxury I wanted. <laughs> and, when, and when the meat would come for the whole prison, I'd buy all of the meat uh, <laughs> for the stew. So I feel bad. The rest of the inmates, all they got was potato and carrots. And, uh, we, got, <clears throat> and we had steaks. I mean, I had lobster in prison. I had champagne. Uh, I ran I, the prison. Did you pay the guards off? Like, I mean, oh, did, yeah. you, did you have cash in your cell or, or did you, did, did you have... Guard, the guards will bring it in for us. Wow. The, the guards yeah. brought in the cash or, 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 or the champagne? Whatever, whatever we wanted. Now, wow. I didn't deal with drugs. I didn't deal with drugs because that's not something that I would put anybody... Come, I mean, if, if a guard got caught because I was paying him off, all he could say is he brought me laughter or champagne. Exactly, yeah. A, a yeah. lot different. A lot different. He'll get fired, but a lot different than he's bringing me cocaine or marijuana, right? But, but so, I mean, what, 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 while you were in prison, you had like, I mean, you have tens of millions of dollars on your bank account outside the prison. So, 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 so you Oh, yeah, no. And, wanted. and I was still making money. And the yeah. thing was that uh, I also, if I kept the peace for the guards, because remember, these guards don't get paid nothing. Yeah. I mean, all the drugs that comes into a prison anywhere in, the, in America, probably in the world, is brought in by the guards, right? That's yeah. it. I mean, I mean, prisoners don't go outside to buy drugs. No. So they don't get much, paid much, and they risk their life. So one of the things that I also did is that I made sure that I kept the peace in the prison. That exactly. there, will be no, ah. there will be no stabbing, there will be no riots, 
That's a good you point. Know, any of that. And, uh, and that brought me a lot of favor. Hey, I mean, pretty and, nice if you get ice cream every morning. If, if, I don't get that at, at home. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I never, I never laid in the same sheets twice. Wow. Because, yeah. You can imagine when those sheets go to the laundry, what, what happened with a lot of mother sheets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? wow. Uh, and... Uh, and then after a while, you, you got to Eglin Air Force Base. You paid, you and your lawyer paid somebody $100,000. Was that a pure bribe yeah. to, 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 to get to Air Force what Base? What happened was the designating officer yeah. that, that, that was in charge, because I was original jurisdiction, right? Which yeah. in that is like you're part of our organized crime family. So everything for me is, handled by, is not handled at the local prison level. It's handled by headquarters. Yeah. So... It would have been impossible for me to be transferred, right? With yeah. not with who I was. I'm being I'm going to a prison that had no fences. Yeah. <laughs> so when this guy's about to retire or is retiring, his best friend was one of my attorneys in Atlanta. Ah. Right. And uh, and I paid, we paid him a hundred thousand dollars in 1980, 81, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And uh, he transferred me to England. When I got to England, oh man, that warden went nuts. He <laughs> like. Yeah. Are you doing here? Who who did you bribe? I said bribe. You mean federal prison officials can be bribed? And, 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 and uh, it, like so, so. Then your like lawyer bought just a bag of cash to that guy. That was it basically. And and that, then then wow. Then and, I was sent, and then and then I got to Eglin, and they said, okay, but you're never gonna work outside the prison because Eglin, the prisoners take care of the Air Force base, right? Yeah. So literally, you're a free man inside the biggest Air Force base. You're driving a truck. You going around all the guards, I mean, all the military people, I mean, you live a life, right? Yeah. So he's like, you're never going to ever leave outside prison. You know, you're going to work inside the prison, right? Yeah. So that was like a punishment, but they ended up sending me to work at the hospital. Yeah. And I ended up having a relationship with a lady that worked at the hospital. <laughs> I, was, I was having sex with her every day and she was bringing me food. So I was living the life. Pretty nice prison uh, sentence. And, and oh, how, how many years was this total prison sentence if you combine both Eglin and, and the first year? Uh, I, and I, the, the first place? Yeah, I stayed all together the first year, the first uh, sentence, five years. Okay, five years, so, yeah. I think I stayed at Eglin, I think maybe three years. Yeah. Three and a half years, maybe. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember exactly how long I stayed at Eglin. Uh, but I did most of my time at Eglin. And, and then I read here, then after first prison time, you, you were free. Then I, I quote from your book here, like, in no time at all, I set up a considerable network. Uh, I was under scrutiny under, of the DA, so I couldn't expose myself in any way. I no longer saw drugs or money. Uh, but uh, my, my business was limited to picking up the phone and giving orders, arranging new routes, new transporters, and mainly giving the orders when a plane could be sent to Miami or not. For this, after every load, I received between one and three million dollars. That's crazy. Yeah. And I, 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 was that every week then, or uh, every basic? month? Every month, yeah. Now one, one, one month, one month we did it three times because it was my birthday, and it was uh, leap year, and I wanted to bring in three loads in the same day. Wow! I wanted to, I wanted to do what nobody thought we could do, which was bring three airplanes the same day. And and. So, and uh, I mean, the airplanes you bought before your first prison time, I mean, those must, did you still have them or did you have to buy new, new airplanes? No, I never, I never, uh, the only airplanes I owned were the jets, my private jets. Ah. I never had any airplane for smuggling because I always, I always subbed that out. I always ah. I specialized in that, right? Oh, um, because I saw a picture of you like this 1980s style airplane or a private jet while you're sitting with the sunglasses on or something. It, it's oh, on that, the that's my hawker with my gold Cartier uh, custom-made glasses. Custom oh, glasses. oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I was like, oh, the guy was smuggling in these planes. Yeah, pretty nice. But now I get it. It was just for transportation. And yeah, yeah, not no, that was my hawker. I love that plane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, had a, I had a hawker, I had a Merlin, and I had a Jet Ranger helicopter. Wow. And, and, and those, uh, yeah, they were jets. Because uh, the only time I went in a, in a private uh, jet, that was actually, I think, a propeller plane. That was a hawker. I went it from Sweden down to Baden-Baden with a, a Russian guy, a Russian friend I know. Uh, and I mean, that's the only time I went in a private jet. But, but uh, uh, so, so, okay. So you had the private jets for personal transportation and not for smuggling, of course. Makes right, sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. So that, that's, what, that's what was good. Uh, with us, so uh, at Eglin, then uh, they then 
after like about a year, they thought that I was having an affair with, with, a, with a woman that worked in the hospital. Yeah. And to punish me, to punish me, they sent me to the base. Oh. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, all right. And I still, I still kept having sex with her. We would have sex in the chapel because I figured, well, no one's going to be looking in the chapel. Of course. <laughs> but shortly after being at Eglin, I met my, my second wife. Uh, I met her and I bought an apartment literally at uh, four kilometers outside the base and I went home every day. Wow. I bribed the general. I bribed the general and I got a sticker for, I bought a brand new van and I got a sticker and she would come pick me up. And they were looking for me for two years because they knew that I, somehow they knew that I was meeting my, my girlfriend at that time. Yeah. And uh, when, I, when I walked out, there was a, a lieutenant that was a really cool guy, real good friend of mine. He's like, hey, I never asked you this because you and I are close, but I just want to ask you this, man. Number one, were you seeing your wife? I said, every day. <laughs> every said, day. In prison. Said, we looked for you everywhere. We couldn't find you. Where the hell were you hiding? I said, I wasn't hiding. I said, where were you looking? He says, all over the base. I said, that's the problem. I was outside the base. Of and course. he's like, oh, shit. No, you didn't have the balls to go outside the base. I said, dude, I went outside the base for one and a half years. Every freaking day. But, I knew you guys would never thought I, I dare go outside the base. Uh, but uh, kind of, I mean, this first prison sentence, uh, right after you got released, it's kind of, you, you, now looking back, this must be your like very low point in life because you, have, you didn't learn anything from your prison sentence and you just continue to be even worse when you came out of prison. You've continued to smuggle. So, so, oh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, and you, you, you smuggled with El, El Camino pickups and you had something called suicide cars. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was exciting. Uh, no, I didn't learn it. I think, I mean, prison to me, the first time was nothing but a party. I mean, yeah. I, had a, I had a great time in prison, man. If they told me I had to do 10 years, I would have done 10 years. <laughs> no, I mean, bad. I ate whatever I want. I had my cus I had a custom made boots made and I had my boot maker come and measure me inside the prison <laughs> to make my $5,000. Uh, 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 the guy used to be a master boot maker for Lucchese. And, uh, and I remember one guard telling me, what are you doing, marriage? It's going to be a long time before you go home. I said, no, I'm going to wear those in the prison. And he's like, are you crazy? How the hell are you going to get it in there? You know, what I said, dude, yeah. if you catch me bringing my boots in there, I said, you know what? I'll cut my balls. Yeah. Because I'm going to tell you something. I pay my gardener three times what you make. So there's no way in the world you ever going to catch me. If you catch me, then I might as well just... Capit capitate myself, you know, <laughs> castrate myself. And, uh, and I did. I, so I, I did not learn nothing. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, like I, I tell people, prison doesn't change people, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, th that's the thing. I mean, prison didn't change you. The thing that changed you was actually God and prison. Yeah. Yeah, what changed me was I had this void. You know, I tell people, listen, I had this void inside of me that I couldn't fill. That yeah. society told me, hey, if you got these cars, you'll be happy. And, you know, I had the most gorgeous cars in the world. I was miserable. Oh, if you go out with these beautiful women, I dated the prettiest supermodels. And, and, and I was miserable. If you got mad, I had everything a man would want at the age of 23. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 and I can see in your book here, when you came out the second time from prison, um, uh, you, you, you had a party for your mother and daughter when, when she, they got, uh, what you say, uh, baptized or something? And the champagne bill... That, that was the first time. The first time I came out of prison. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. The first time. Yeah, of course. The, sec the second time is now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we had, we had, uh, we did her baptism at Regine's. You yeah. know, and it was the number, in 90, and that was in uh, 1985, it was the number one nightclub in the world, right? Yeah. We and, had, uh, one, had one in Paris, one in Monaco. Uh, ah. One in New York, one in Miami. That's all wow. they had. Wow. Ah. And yeah, champagne bill was fifty-five thousand dollars. And because my daughter's name was Crystal, so yeah. I I had them serve nothing but Crystal. Of course. And and the most crazy thing, I gave a thousand dollar tip to each of the waiter. I mean, that's fine. But to each of the twenty bodyguards who provided security for our party, <laughs> you, had, you had twenty bodyguards. <laughs> well, because they knew. I mean, you know, this was like. This, and at this time, Miami was a bit, probably the most dangerous city in the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. There, was, there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was cops. There was a, cop, a group of, of cops and drug dealers that got together 
and they were called the river cops. You can look that up. Exactly. I read about it. That's crazy. I, I, I've heard uh, ab about that. Uh, let me find something about that. Uh, uh, and and uh, I heard from another clip that actually one of your bodyguards were, were chased by these corrupt police officers, right? Yeah, or, or, yeah, one of, uh, yeah the time that Eddie pulled a yeah. gun on him. Yeah, well, and, 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 uh, and Willie Falcone's mom got oh, taken. Really? Yeah. I, 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 but, she, but she survived or she, she was... Well, they paid. They paid. We yeah. paid 700 and some odd thousand dollars. Uh, 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 wow. Uh, uh, what, what happened to... to um... Because what they would do is they would stop you in a police car, right? Yeah. Stop your mom. But they yeah. knew everything. Because again, the drug, this is why I don't know who the robber is or, or any of those people. Because it was a little world, right? Yeah. Everybody, everybody knew when a load was coming in, who was bringing it, how, mu how many kilos. I mean, it was... Especially in the Cuban community, you could say, because yeah. the, 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 these river cops were cu of Cuban or, or origin, you could say. Uh, they, were, they were Cuban American and, and with drug dealers. So the drug dealers would find all the information. Yeah. They would stop your mom and say, hey, Mrs. Valdez, there's a problem with your license. Come in the back of the car. Yeah. But you come, they would take her. I mean, they treated them. They had doctors for them. I mean, they treated them like, but then they called his father and say, hey, we got your wife. Don't tell the boys because they're crazy. And we know you just got a million dollars yesterday or 700 some thousand. So wow. pay up and we'll kill her. Uh, I, 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 what, what happened with, with Eddie there, your bodyguard? What, uh, <laughs> with Eddie was a, a whole different story. Yeah. What happened with Eddie was that was when I was supposed to go to California. And that was an inside a group of guys that actually worked for me. Yeah. And uh, I was supposed to go to California. When I, and what I would do is I would always... Uh, have breakfast in the jet, right? So they knew yep. exactly what to have for me in the pilot. And, uh, and when I went to step on the jet, I started to throw up and had diarrhea. And I was like, man, I, I've been feeling great all day. So I went into the hangar and uh, I stayed there about 30 minutes when I thought I was feeling good again. I went in there and I went to put a foot on the plane again. The same thing happened. Yeah. And, I told, and I told Eddie, I said, uh, Eddie, you go for me. Be, and tell him I'll go next week. I can't go. I'm going to throw up all over this freaking plane. Yeah. It was coming out of both sides like, <laughs> like horrible. Yeah. And, uh, and he got killed. They were waiting for me. There was a contact on my life. Wow. And instead of me, they got him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. That, that was at that point because he was a guy that I really loved dearly. And that began to change. Well, my change was already happening because my mother was very religious, right? So my mother was brilliant. I tell people, my mother is the perfect example of tough love. Yeah. She cut me no slack. She like, let me know, son, whatever you're doing, doesn't please God. Son, whatever you're doing, doesn't please God. This is not exactly. what I worked on my life to give you an education. And I can't believe you're doing this to us. And then she would stop. And then she would say, what do you want for dinner tonight? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But she, she wanted to get that out to you all the time. I, 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 I could always, understand I it. Always, and I always knew what true north was. See, that's the biggest thing I tell parents. You, yeah. got to teach your, you got to teach your children what true north is. Because yeah. if they deviate, they're going to know where to come back to. So yeah. that, that, was, that was really like dawning on me, you know? And uh, <clears throat> so then I was already feeling like I wanted it out. I mean, I had more money than I could ever spend the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and it's an interesting thing, a question that they asked me for this uh, interview that no one ever asked me. And, and I answered it, and it relates to this. But I'll finish with my mom. And, uh, and what happened is, so shortly after that, so I, I had this friend of mine who used to come to my ranch to breed his horses to my, his mares, to my horse. Yeah. And, and he had walked away from the marijuana building. And I, used, I liked him a lot. His name was Lazaro. I said, Lazaro, how, how'd you get out? And he's like, like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. Yeah. So if you get out, you got to get out. You got to move away. Cut you everything cut off. People, you got to cut with everybody you know. And to me, that was hard because so many people depended upon me, you yeah. know. But in the back of my mind, I already had it that, well, yeah, a lot of people depend on me. But when I went to prison, every freaking body abandoned me, you yeah. know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you said the only two friends you have in prison, it's your mom and dad, basically, your parents. And my brother. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I, 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 and... Uh, y y yeah, see a headline here. It's three Miami cops arrested in slaying of drug suspects. The Miami <coughs> River cops there. And, and, and by the speaking of Eddie there, was it ever solved who killed Eddie? 
Uh, it, was, it was a guy. It was a guy that was very close to someone that I had uh, delivering uh, cocaine for me in California. Uh, uh, was he caught? I mean, is he locked up now? The murder? Or? You know, here's one thing that I thank God. We found him. Okay, yeah. within two days, he was in New York. We found him. Wow. And I wanted to go and kill him myself. <laughs> Good, you didn't. And, uh, and and what happened? And I thank God I didn't because yeah. I did not. Something came up. And I couldn't go the day I was going to go, right after they found him. Yeah. So for three days, I couldn't go. And he ended up working out a deal with the people that had him and paid them off and got away. Wow. And I thank God because, you know, I'm not a murderer. I never murder anyone, never order anyone's death. And, exactly. Uh, I've uh, never been able to live with that. But it was, it was really painful. And uh, the most painful was at the funeral. That's when, when, this, when I believe that God began to really just knock me down because his little daughter, I had just baptized her six months earlier. And she, thought she was a little older than my daughter, but not much. And she's like, Godfather, my daddy went to be with Jesus. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Gustav, it was the first time that I shed a tear since the day I left Cuba as a 10-year-old. Wow. Never again. People used to say that eyes ran through my veins. I wouldn't yeah. cry for nothing. And I, and I said to myself, number one, if there is a Jesus, we ain't going there. <laughs> exactly. No, the simple part was, when will my daughter tell that to someone and she'll never see me again? Yeah. And that just began to eat me alive. Yeah. And within three months of that, I walked away. Oh, it was three months after the murder of Eddie. Wow. Uh, uh. Yeah. It was, uh, I just, I got away and I mean, I, uh, I walked away and I'm like, look, they asked me and I thought I'd be killed because, you know, there's not a good retirement program in the cartel, right? No. <laughs> so, and, and they don't like the unknown. That's what they can't deal with is the unknown. So they're like, why would George walk away? He, yeah. doesn't, do, he doesn't do nothing. And I kind of read the, the, the thing that saved your life leaving the cartel is that uh, between the 70s and up to you leaving, you never lied to the cartel or anyone else, kind of. You, you, you were yeah. very honest. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and you got this confirmed by somebody yeah. in, in the cartel. Right. And I told this and I told my guys, listen, no one dies for telling the truth. No exactly. matter what mistake you make, we can pay back money. We can buy kilos again. We can make a million or whatever, but don't freaking lie. Yeah. If you don't lie, you're going to be safe. You're going to be all right. And, uh, and, and it was an opportunity where Pablo asked me to join with him to lie about something, you know, where he wanted to offer insurance yeah that insurance exactly yeah and and, and, uh, and he had that whole uh scheme where literally it was going to be a victimless crime right because no one was going to get hurt yeah basically he was gonna so if you gave him 10 kilos and you paid three thousand extra insurance and all of a sudden the drugs didn't get to your buyer or to your client then because he got confiscated or thrown in the ocean or whatever yeah. you get your drugs back right so but what ended up happening is, and you wouldn't have to pay the freight on them. Yeah. So literally, all, all you would do is lose time, right? Yeah. So you give it to me in April, and I'm like, hey, Gustav, look, the, the deal got confiscated, but you paid uh, insurance. You bought insurance, so here's the deal. Because then you have to pay the insurance until it got to Miami. Yeah. So they got to Miami. So all they did is get their drugs back. But I looked at him, and I'm like, I'm not going to participate in that. And he's like... But why not? I said, because it's a lie. Yeah. And if I say that now, when would someone tell you that I lied about you? And, uh, and you're not going to believe me. I said, do whatever you want. I said, yeah. no, one knows. no one's going to come and ask me. Make yeah. all the millions you want. Pay all, sell all the insurance you want to sell. But yeah. you know, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with that. And, uh, and later on, when he put a contact on my life, because someone told him that I had used one of his airstrips in Mexico yeah. without his permission the guy that came to kill me happened to be a guy that I helped a lot when his boss got murdered. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, I got him the job with Pablo. Uh -huh. Who killed his boss? <laughs> who wow. His boss? And, uh, 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 and who was that boss? <laughs> actually, was, actually, at that time, probably was the richest of them all. It was a guy named Frank, Frank Jimenez. Yeah. And, and he, made, he was stupid because at a party, he made a comment that, yeah, Pablo's got all the fame, but I got all the money. Uh, and it was true. It was, it was probably three times as rich as Pablo. Yeah. But that was enough for Pablo to hit him. Wow. He had, he had no respect for no human life, nothing. 
you know. Uh, so, uh, sp speaking about respect, I, I saw a quote. Um, the more money you have, the more respect and consideration you get. But if people identify you with your money, what will happen when you don't have it anymore? Uh, exactly. So, uh, that, that, that's, that's kind of what you also figured out after you gave away all your money or gave, <laughs> gave back no, all the money. People, listen, there is positional authority and moral authority, right? Yeah. Moral authority is the same as respect. You earn it. Positional yeah. authority is equal to fear. So yeah. if you fear me, I got power over you, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what happened with Pablo. A yeah. lot of people feared him until one day someone doesn't fear you anymore. Yeah. But exactly. respect you earn. All right? Exactly. And, that's, and that's moral authority. People will follow you to death if they believe in you. If they know that, that, that you are, you know, transparent, that, yeah. whatever, that your word is, is gold, that you will never do what you say you're never going to do and that you will always do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. And, and, and then you earn that respect, right? And when you yeah. earn that respect or your moral authority, then people will follow you to, to death. Well, yeah. Pablo didn't have that. Pablo, all he had was, you know, position yeah. authority, right? Yeah. This is powerful yeah. and, and everyone knew that, that even though he wasn't the richest or the most powerful, he was the most violent. Yeah. Bar none. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, if he killed you, he killed every male related to you. Yeah, pl plum or plata, or what, what, what was the uh, lead, lead or... Yeah, yeah, yeah money no. or lead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, plata, plata, yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> that, that was the thing with them. And with me, everybody respected me. First of all, because as a 23-year-old, I get yeah. arrested in a penny man prison, and for 30 days, I'm tortured to the point that I bled for five years every time I pissed. Yeah, really, that, the, I wouldn't even give him anybody's name. The, and, the, the, <clears throat> those days before your first prison sentence, uh, this was uh, abroad. Um, you, you, you crashed your, 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 uh, one of your smuggling planes, right? Uh, right. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 we can't give everybody the whole story so they, they won't buy the book. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> should, should have, but, 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 uh, heard, heard.